Good afternoon, everyone. We're here from Arctic Free Church of Scotland, continuing. We're glad to be out this afternoon again. Earlier on this morning, we didn't think we would make it because of the weather, but we're glad that it's dried up to a certain extent, and we're back out seeking to bring to your attention uh, the good news of the Christian gospel. We come out because we're commissioned by uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave his disciples a commission at the end of Matthew chapter 28. You can read it there for yourself. He, he gave them a commission to go forth and to proclaim the gospel. Now these early Christians, they had no churches or whatever but they fulfilled the commission as far as it was humanly possible for them to do. But of course the commission was to go into the whole of the world and obviously the disciples could never do that by themselves in their own lifetime. And therefore the commission has fallen upon those who follow in the, first, in the footsteps of the early apostles and the disciples. And therefore we are taking the gospel out this afternoon because we believe that the commission that the Lord Jesus gave to his disciples there before he ascended up into heaven is as real and as vital today as it was some 2,000 years ago. And it's a pleasure indeed to be able to come out and to tell you the good news because but there is another reason why we come out, not just has the Lord Jesus commissioned his church to go out with the gospel, but we come out because, friends, we have to admit and you have to acknowledge yourselves that most people today do not go to a Christian place of worship. Most people today on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday, are not found in a Christian place of worship. Instead, they're working or instead they're shopping, or instead they're watching or participating in sporting activities, or any other kind of entertainment. Maybe they're at the garden center, maybe they're working at their gardens, maybe they're doing home DIY, whatever. Usually the large proportion of the population in Glasgow and in Scotland today does not go to a Christian place of worship and therefore because they do not go to a Christian place of worship they will not hear the Christian gospel they will be ignorant of it and therefore that is another reason why we seek to come out because the message that we bring is vitally important for everyone to hear and we should not be ignorant of it and very often today people make up their minds concerning Christianity by absorbing other people's opinions. They might listen to the media, whether it be social media or whether it might be the television or the radio or the print media. They very often make up their minds second hand and they never really accurately consider the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to come out this afternoon and to use this opportunity to draw to your attention the claims of the Lord Jesus. And friends, before we really begin, we would urge you to take up your Bibles. Yes, to look at that old dusty book that may well be in a bookshelf in your house. Take it up, begin to read it. Because all that we seek to do this afternoon is simply draw your attention to what's in the Bible, to the teachings that are in the Bible. Now many people would say that, well, the Bible's an old book, and certainly that is true. It has been written, we could say, over 2,000 years ago. The earliest parts of the Bible, or I should say, the latest parts of the Bible, were, would date from about 2,000 years ago. But some of the other items in the Bible would have a, a longer history than that. 
it would be neither three or four thousand years ago. And therefore you might well be saying to me, what can a book that's at least two thousand to three thousand years old, what has it got to say to contemporary mankind today? Well, it has a lot to say. Because the Bible is a unique book. The Bible is God's Word. It's not my word. It's not the word of the Christian church. It's not the word of my denomination. It alone claims to be God's word. It's the word of God that he has given to mankind. Holy men of God were moved. They were moved to write what they wrote. And they wrote under inspiration. What does that mean? Well, it simply means that in all the things that they wrote in the Bible, it was not their own minds they were conveying. It was not their own thoughts. It was what God would have us know. It was God revealing his word and his will for mankind. And since mankind has not changed since the fall, that word is apt and it is appropriate and it is bang up to date for modern, sophisticated mankind today. Why is that so? Well, it is so because the Bible is a book primarily of redemption. What does that mean? What does that word redemption mean? Well, it means to purchase to buy back and in the Bible we have a record of God working out a way of redemption whereby fallen mankind could be restored to a loving and a lively and a living relationship with his creator now before we can possibly grasp that we have to lay down one or two uh, foundational stones facts that will not flatter us but they will inform us and once we have grasped these fundamental basic facts we will then understand the great message of the Bible and appreciate the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ to an even to an even greater extent than we do today if we go back to the beginning, and who was there in the beginning? Only God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God was there right at the very beginning. He's the one who has created this earth, this universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the seas, the mountains, the birds, the fishes, the insects, the animals, and then ultimately mankind himself. And God is the one who created all this out of nothing. The Bible tells us that he spoke, and as he spoke, those things came into being. God created man, male and female, after his own image in knowledge righteousness and holiness with dominion over the creatures and right there at the very beginning of time when god created man male and female after his own image that speaks to our culture today god created man male and female there are not a hundred or so genders. There are only two genders, male or female. And it doesn't matter what governments will tell us. It doesn't matter what scientists will tell us. It doesn't matter what intellectuals will tell us. We believe what the Word of God tells us. And what does the Word of God tell us? God created man, male and female after his own image in knowledge righteousness and holiness and therefore to say that the bible does not speak to us today is nonsense the bible is bang up to date 
it speaks to our culture in many, many ways. And I've just highlighted one of them. But there, right back at the beginning, God created man, male and female, and they were perfect. They were perfect. They did not fear God in the sense that they feared judgment and punishment. They did not run away from God. Instead, they had a lovely, beautiful relationship with their Creator. And they enjoyed fellowship and communion and a one-to-one -one relationship with their Creator for a period of time. But you might well know the story as we find it in Genesis chapter 3. And there in Genesis chapter 3, what do we find? The evil one, Satan, he came and he tempted the weaker vessel. Who's the weaker vessel? The weaker vessel was Eve. She was tempted. She was tempted to eat the forbidden fruit. You see, God had given Adam and also Eve a simple command. They could eat from all the trees in the Garden of Eden. They could eat the fruit. They could eat it. But there was one tree that they were not to eat the fruit of. And that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the evil one, Satan, came along and he tempted Eve. And he said words to this effect. Look, the fruit is lovely. Why don't you eat it? She said, God has forbidden us even to look at it or to eat it. And what did he say? Oh, God wants to hold you back. He does not want you to reach your full potential. He wants to confine you. He wants to fetter you. Because the moment that you eat this fruit, you shall be like God. That's what he said to our first mother. She forgot that she was already made in the image of God. But she disobeyed. She took the fruit, she ate it. And she gave some to to Adam and he disobeyed and he ate the fruit. Now you might think that's not a very significant event, but I tell you friends, that is a most significant event. Why? Because our first parents committed high treason. That's what they did. They sided with God's enemy. They listened to a liar. They listened to a cheat. They listened to a murderer. And they obeyed him rather than obey their creator. And when that happened, the whole of mankind or the experience of mankind changed. Why? Because sin entered into human existence. What is sin? Sin is any want of or conformity unto the law of God. They had broken God's law. They had disobeyed God. They had eaten the, 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 the forbidden fruit. And because of that, sin came into man's experience. Things changed. They died spiritually. They didn't die physically. They continued to live. They had family. They lived for many hundreds of years after that, but they died spiritually. That was, the, that was the threat. If they would disobey God, they would die, and that's what happened. They died spiritually. What does that mean? It means they no longer had that relationship with God that they once enjoyed. Once they were happy to be with God, they were happy to have fellowship with God, but when they sinned, they hid from God. And is this not true today? Again, the Bible speaks to us today, does it not? Many people don't go to the house of God because they don't want to hear God's word. They run away from God. That's what our first parents did. Why did they run away from God? They ran away from God because they had a guilty conscience. Sin was troubling them. They knew that things were not right. They knew that things were not the way that they once were. Could that explain your behavior today? We would invite you to come to the house of God 
we would invite you to come and to be under the means of grace to hear the word of God read and to hear it explained and applied to your life but maybe your reaction is well I'm not going to go there I don't want to hear what God has to say to me why is it it is because you have a guilty conscience why have you got a guilty conscience you have a guilty conscience because of your own personal sin you see sin separates us from our Creator but the good news of the Christian gospel friends is that God has done something about this barrier God has done something about our sin God has done something that we could not do in of ourselves what has he done well the Bible is a record of what he has done I said to you at the beginning or near the beginning that the Bible is a book of redemption and how God has worked out a way whereby he might purchase sinners and restore them to fellowship and to communion with himself and it's all through a person it's all through one person and who is that person friends well the Bible speaks about one person and about his work and that person is the Son of God it is the Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible we have 66 books yes the Bible is one book but it contains 66 books and there are 39 books in the Old Testament and there are 27 in the New Testament and basically basically all of these books point us to a person that person is the Lord Jesus Christ no sir no sir we can't we've got a good message for all to hear to forsake their sins and to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we bid all who will hear the day that Jesus Christ will receive you that's why he has come I have come to seek and to save that which was lost he has come to seek and to save the downcast he has come to seek and to save the adulterer, the fornicator, the homosexual, the gossip, the drunkard, the liar, the cheat. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ has come. The Lord Jesus Christ has come in order to seek and to save that which was lost. And friends, this is what we need to realize. That by nature, we are lost. We are lost whether we be morally upright, whether we be a, a model citizen, whether we be law-abiding, or whether we be a down and out, whether we be homeless, whether we be a drunk, whether we be a drug addict, or whatever, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of that, all of us need to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a remarkable incident in John's Gospel. And if you have a Bible, please read this for yourself. It might surprise you when you read it. You go to John chapter 8. And Jesus was in the temple. What was he doing? He was teaching. He was preaching in the Jewish temple. And what happened? The scribes and the Pharisees brought to his attention a woman who had been caught in adultery caught in the very act it says and they said to the Lord Jesus Moses in the law that is in the Old Testament said that if anyone would commit adultery they should be stoned to death but what do you say Jesus did not react to them they did not react to him and again they pressed him what do you see? What's your reaction? This woman was caught in the very act of adultery. They were wanting him to say, well, go and stone her. What did he say instead? He said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone at her. 
they were flabbergasted. Here were religious people. They were the Pharisees and they were the scribes. They were the great religious people of the day. And they had caught this woman in the very act of adultery. You may well ask yourself, how did they catch her in the very act of adultery? Were they involved in it themselves? However, Jesus said to them, let him who is without sin cast the first stone at her. There was silence for a moment. And then they all began to withdraw because their conscience troubled them. Because they knew that if they were going to stone this woman for, to death, then they would have to stone themselves also because they had committed adultery also. Eventually, Jesus was left alone with the woman. And Jesus said, where are thine accusers? Where are all the people who wanted you stoned to death? They're not here, she said. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go your way and sin no more. There the Lord Jesus forgave her sin. She was an adulterer. The law said she should have been stoned to death. But Jesus forgave her. And what did he say to her? Go and sin no more. And what do we have there? We have the very essence of the Christian gospel. The Christian gospel recognizes that we're all sinners. You know, we might be respectable sinners. We might be respectable sinners in the sense that we're not adulterers. We're not thieves. We're not robbers. We're not criminals. And no policeman's going to come to our door and we're never going to appear in court charged with crimes. We live an exemplary life. But nevertheless, we're sinners in the sight of God. Because we have not lived up to his perfect standards. And his law is absolutely perfect and it must be kept. Well, Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. In other words, leave your life of adultery. Leave it behind. You've got a new start. A new hope. The, the slate has been wiped clean in some sense. You've got a new start. Go, rebuild your life and sin no more. And that's what we say to you this afternoon. Every single one who is within earshot of this afternoon. The Bible does not flatter us. It does inform us. It will humble us. It will tell us as we really are. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there is none righteous. No, not one. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. These are things that the Bible teaches. You can find them for yourself. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Or Romans chapter 6, verse 23. There you will find these things. I'm not making them up. And therefore it tells us we're all sinners. But there is a great hope. What is that hope? That hope is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the very sum and the substance of the Bible and of God's message to mankind and, you, and God's message to you this afternoon as we're out here on Partick Station. God has given you a message in his word. He is telling you that you're, you're sinners and you need to be saved and you cannot save yourself. What must you do then? You must come to the Lord Jesus. You must embrace him. And as I've sought to highlight when I retold that story about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, yet she received forgiveness from the Lord Jesus, surely that would tell you and me that no matter what we have done, no matter our sins, no matter how long we've been in this world, and no matter how long we have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, yet there is hope if we will but come to the Lord Jesus. 
that we will call upon him. You know the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Shall be saved. Not might be saved, but shall be saved. What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? What does it mean? It means, friends, to turn your backs upon yourself. Not to look to yourself in order to save you. Not to look at your church. Not to look at your religious leaders or your charity or your good works or anything like that. But to go to the Lord Jesus and call upon him. Admit that you are a sinner. Admit that you deserve God's wrath and curse. But plead for the mercy of God. And you will find, friends, that he is a merciful God. Let me read a verse from Micah. That's in the Old Testament. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Is this not what we need to hear today? A God who pardons iniquity. A God who delighteth in mercy. A God who does not retain his anger forever. It's absolutely remarkable when you consider what we have done, what mankind has done. When you go back to the beginning and when you consider that the whole of creation in some sense was created in order for man and woman to live in perfect harmony with their creator. You know God created the heavens and the earth and everything in it in six days, but man was his last creation. Man was his last. In other words, he was preparing the creation to put mankind at the very zenith, at the very center of creation. And what did man do? Man sinned against God. What did God do? You know, man ran away. Adam and Eve, because they sinned, they no longer wanted to be in the presence of God. But what did God do? God worked out a way whereby mankind could be reconciled unto himself. Is this not remarkable when you consider all that God had done for mankind only to be treated in such a despicable manner by Adam and Eve? You would think that God would just destroy them all and begin again. But no. God provided a way whereby mankind could be reconciled. And it was God who took the initiative not man. You know, sometimes you hear that, that people say they're seeking after God. That's nonsense. Absolute nonsense according to the word of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 and, and following, as it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. But God was not content to leave the things as they were. And God in the fullness of time sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And that's what happened when the Son of God became the Son of Man, when Jesus Christ was born, when he came into this world, he was God's answer to mankind's greatest need. And that's why we come out this afternoon 
We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland, continuing. We meet at Two Thornwood Terrace. That's go up Dumbarton Road. You'll come to the police station. And when you come to the police station, go up the hill opposite the police station. You will come then, first of all, to Thornwood Primary School. And we are there on the crossroads next door to the school. We meet on the Lord's Day. That's Sunday at 11 a.m. And again at 6 p.m. on Sunday. We also have a, a midweek meeting, 7.30 on Wednesday. And we would extend a warm welcome to every one of you. Everyone who's within earshot of this, we extend a sincere welcome to you. Come along as you are. Come along. You don't need anything fancy to wear. Come along. You will be made most welcome. And you will hear more concerning the author of our salvation, the great hope that the Christian has in the Lord Jesus Christ. You will hear more about this person and what he has done and how it's vitally important for us all to know him as our Lord and as our Savior. We're going to take a very short break, but may God bless his word to you uh, this afternoon. <laughs> 